everyone I'm talking. So, who's a designer? Hands up there. Okay, loads of designers, great. Who's a developer? Excellent. Uh, any project managers? Yeah, so just to be clear with this, this is not like insightful terms like that. This is a Halloween themed thing, okay? So the coffins and everything else, that's just, you know, there's, there's no connection there at all, okay? So, um, first of all, one of the themes that are coming through with all the, the presentations today, and we've got a massive change going on in the industry. There's loads of job titles that don't exist anymore. So, first of all, we have the guys who used to copy the code from you know, staging to production, the ops guys, well, DevOps makes that a programmatic thing now. Uh, you've got all those lovely test engineers that we kind of try to get rid of. You know, there's, there's loads of these jobs that don't exist anymore. And having a dedicated project manager is one of them. <coughs> which is, is actually pretty bad news for me, right? So I was hired in the near form as a project manager, right? So, uh, yeah, so, uh, Interesting, going, going from a developer where I started into kind of a managing things and, and being a product manager and being in control, right? And so, first of all, just to understand very, very clearly what project management actually is, okay? Project managers are magic, okay? So they, at the start of a project, they are responsible for understanding the scope, the feature set that has to be done, right? And then they need to figure out kind of what resources they need, what kind of developers, designers, what kind of time they need to actually make this happen. And then they, they get in their business analysts to convert the ideas into like a structured set of requirements. Um, you know, they, they then they get the requirements, they give it to the dev team, they give it to the test team, you know, they've got a lovely Gantt chart that shows them clearly kind of how all these, you know, different uh, functions will work along the way. And, um, and, and the kind of the project Software is built, the software is tested, the software goes live, and everything goes live exactly and matches what the business owner at the start kind of fed into the process. Um, and that's where it all starts to go wrong. Okay? So, and, and the reason is that the project manager is one step removed from all the things. So they're supposed to identify risks and manage them, right? Which makes perfect sense when you're in the real world and you're building a building, right? And you know the risks, you know, it might rain, it might be an earthquake, I don't know, it depends on where you are. In software, we're in an n-dimensional space. There is an incredible number of risks that can hit you. It tends to vary significantly project to project. Every project should be considered a new build with a heap of new parameters kicking in. So this magical project manager who is trying to actually have his lovely risk matrix and manage all the projects, uh, you know, risks and get this, you know, lovely mitigation going and make sure everything's delivered on time is set up for failure, okay? There's absolutely no chance of success. So what, what, what I like to think of is this lovely concept of an inland lighthouse, okay? So inland lighthouse, it doesn't matter how bright this lighthouse is. This lighthouse is useful. It's 400 miles from the coast. It's useless. It's, it's, there's, let's say useful? Anyway, it's useless. <laughs> so, what, what you have is, you've got a project manager who is looking at a set of requirements that are based on assumptions that the person, the business person that's asking for something to be done, that product to be built, can actually tell you what they want. That's, that's rubbish, right? And then, there's the idea that the guys, that you can identify risks in advance from you know, knowing about project management when every project is so different. <coughs> So, uh, if you map it back to the way an MVP starts, it starts, it starts to get very, very interesting. Um, and that's where you say, right, you know, MVP, the business wants to deliver an application process, let's just say that. There's a new product in the business, it's previously been a paper form or Excel thing, and we want to create a nice product that will do this. It's a simple thing to explain. Project manager then comes in and figures out exactly who needs to get involved and gets everything kicked off, right? And all the projects that kick off like that, there's loads of assumptions made and all the mistakes are made day one, okay? And it's lovely and you hear it very, very simply, right? So typically you'll have a, a fixed feature set, you'll have a fixed delivery period and a fixed cost. But 
we're going to deliver everything in agile process. Absolutely, because that doesn't break agile at all. There's no, there's no problem, right? So there's loads and loads of these things to start. And it, it, when you actually reduce it to a very trivial example, you start to understand why they don't make sense. Because the project manager is becoming a middle, middle man. So think about a murder scene. And you have an eyewitness that sees somebody running away from the murder scene. So you grab them and you bring them to the police station. And then you appoint a project manager who explains that this person now needs to sit down and describe in detail that suspect that was running away from the murder scene. So you get a lovely detailed requirement spec, right? And then you get that requirement spec and you bring it over to the sketch artist who then starts working away at the sketch and they finish the sketch and then they bring it back. And lo and behold, it doesn't come close to matching what the suspect looks like, okay? So, that middleman is why project management is a problem. Okay? And it's very, very obvious to see with the sketch artist. The right way, of course, is the eyewitness comes in and you sit them with the sketch artist and then you get a nice little process going. The sketch artist can say, well, is this the shape of the head? And the guy goes, well, no, it's a bit square. And the sketch artist iterates and iterates and iterates and converges on the picture. That's a very, very good likeness of the suspect. All good, right? So, and that's design driven development. Brilliant, you can solve all our problems, right? So, um, it depends on how long you've been in software. So, uh, when Waterfall was around, that was going to solve our problems, right? Then Agile came in, that was going to solve all our problems, Extreme Agile. Um, uh, we now have Radical Agility, uh, David, sorry. For sure. uh, again, these, these things solve all our problems. So, the design driven development is wonderful, right? So, you get our a business owner, they know exactly what they want. You get them together with a designer. And the designer builds a picture of what happens. And they work iteratively together and they get something that they're really, really happy with. And then the designer brings that to the development team and works with the development team. And, then, and what you've done there is you've made your designer, your beautiful unicorn designer, the unicorn designers that are really hard to find, and you've made them a project manager. And the best designers, generally not good project managers. So what you need to do is to get more integrated, okay? So, uh, and th this will come through in all the talks. This is kind of a, it's, it's obvious when you actually put it back, right? The, the whole thing that's wrong is to think about a controlling point, like a project manager that knows everything and controls everything and changes all the parameters and gets everything all in line on time. What you need to think about is an intelligent, talented team that will deliver. Okay, and that's when you actually do that, then it's not just design driven development and it's not agile and it's not, it's really, really simple. It's, it's these few points of confidence working together. So you've got a, a customer, right? If the customer doesn't know what they want, it's very difficult to do a good job. So if the customer is wrong, you're dead anyway. But let's assume we get the customer right. They know what they, they want, they can express it. You've got a designer that can interpret that into a kind of a, a look and feel and an outline. You've got developers that can actually build it. And you get them all working together as a team, okay? And the difference between the old way of doing it and the new way of doing it is much like building missiles, okay? So missiles used to be ballistic missiles, right? So you, you want to take a satellite out, right? So you, you key in your components at the very, very start. It's like the requirements in the water process. And your missile shoots off and it's going to take out your satellite, okay? And that works if you know exactly where your satellite is going to be and everything else, and you get your maps right and everything works really, really well. That's the reason that software development projects regularly fail is because the assumptions are wrong, the maps are wrong, where the satellite is supposed to be is wrong. You know, people misunderstood what was important. And uh, very often, you know, people ask for things that they, they think they want and not what they need. And you, you've got to tease that out. So what you need to do is you need to build a heat-seeking missile, way more effective. So all you need to do at the start is make sure it's pointing up, right? And it takes off, and then it slowly but surely turns itself, and as it, as it close up, you get it closer and closer, and you hit your target more often than not. So that's the aim, is to build a heat-seeking missile. But how do you actually do it? So um, in your form, you build uh, quite a few MVPs every year. That's when we take things from scratch. Uh, we put the team together and we, we do
do a few things at the start of the process to kind of get things set up the right way. Um, projects are very, very much about planting an orchard. If you, you can make so many mistakes day one that your orchard will never produce fruit. I have a lovely orchard at home, by the way. It's fantastic. It never produces that much. But it's beautiful to look at. Trees are very healthy. But I got a few things wrong day one. So <coughs> the first thing is get the right team set up. Um, this is really interesting. This is where kind of culture comes in and all sorts of things. If the customer is, is quiet and polite, and you put in a really shouty team, that's messed up already, you know? So you've got to get things like that right. You've got to actually get things set up for success. You also need to choose the right skill set in the team. So if it's a very highly visual project where you're gonna, the UI is critical, you need to get a designer and a UX expert, and hopefully that'll be the same person if you're lucky, onto the team as early as possible, okay? You need to, to get to the, the actual developers right on the team. If, if it's all going to be very high, uh, highly performant visualizations, then you need somebody who really knows their front end. Okay? If it's something that's going to involve performance and back end, you might have a different type of engineering team. Get the team, the right team set up. And then get them connected with the customer. And what that means is that they actually have to understand the business goal. And that's, that's great if you're someone like Zalando or Ryanair. That's a really important thing that you can do. And that's one of the successes of those stories. They get everybody to actually understand what the business goals are. Okay? And the other thing is customers' expectations. Right? Very often we work with people who've never built software before. Right? People who are not involved in that process <coughs> regularly assume things that are incredibly difficult are easy, and they assume that things that are very, very easy are difficult. So you've got to get that right. That's very, very important to open that communication and make sure that you manage your expectations. You also need to define success criteria. Did that happen? Uh, one of the questions asked was about the metrics to guys track. On our projects, each one is different. And uh, it used to be that project managers had success criteria, right? Because they have like a list of features, right? And as you implement the features, well then that's success, right? And if you match that to your lovely Gantt chart and you're on track, everything is good, right? So We've got half the features built, and we're half the project, so everything is great, right? And the answer is, very often, that is not the case. Um, and strangely enough, when projects go wrong, uh, you asked the development team, the development team knew it was going wrong already. They knew that actually, well, if there was two or three things at the end, it would take much more time. So what you need to do is you need to figure out how to track success, what are the success criteria, work out in advance, and then track against that in any way that makes sense. Um, <coughs> And the other thing is, you need to build a heartbeat with your project from day one. There's no point in that heat-seeking missile being left alone. It goes too far off track if it does. If you leave that heat-seeking missile alone, it just disappears off and it just also is pointing to the wrong part of the sky and you can never pull it back. So what you need is a heartbeat so that you get developers together every day, you get people doing demos every week, you get the feedback loops, you build those feedback loops so you can actually Take a look at your milestones and you can make sure you're hitting them as you go through your project. And those feedback loops are the critical thing about everything. Okay? So, the, the number one thing is common sense over process. If you're developers and you've been around a while, you might remember patterns and coding. And that was ways of writing code was kind of split into a number of different patterns. And everybody embraced these patterns at the start. And it was a bit mad. It was like, you know, you'd have an idea of a requirements discussion, and the next thing was, well, which pattern are you going to use to implement this? Which is completely the wrong way to do it. So don't try and embrace Agile. Look at what works for Agile, why Agile works in certain context, context. and then do what Zalando did. Take your own version of Agile that will work in your company and make, make it work for you. Um, and more than anything else, uh, we talk about being lean. This is one of the big things about the uh, that, that missile, when you're actually starting, you don't need to be too finicky about what part of the sky it's pointing at. Just make sure it's pointing up, okay? If you think about the very big success story, the guys in Stripe, they didn't build a massive system to automatically validate everything about your, your application to be a credit card merchant. Day one, they built a simple web form that allowed them to get the information so they could do it manually, just to see if anybody actually wanted to do this. So, if you actually approach all your projects this way, you can be very, very lean. You can validate those assumptions. Instead of 
those assumptions trip you up later in your project. You start validating from day one. You're validating, and every time you validate, that's like just tuning that, that missile's path a little bit better. Which brings my second last slide. <laughs> so, um, and the, the thing about this is you have to trust your missile to hit a target. Okay? That means you have to give your team autonomy. And this is the one difference. This is why project managers are really fading away. Because they're this controlling point in a world where it's almost impossible to control enough to generate success. The developers very often will encounter a problem or a risk with the system as they go. They need to be responsible for calling that out. They need to work with other people to actually mitigate those risks as they go. The customer will regularly see something as they go and go, oh, hold on a second, you, you know what? I never said it, but we need the whole thing to do this as well. That's a higher priority than the other stuff I was asking you to do. So there is, a, you know, when we're talking about managing scope, there is a responsibility to manage scope. The designers regularly will come up with snags and problems. It's like, if you want to do it that way, but you know what? That's going to be an awful user experience. That's going to be really difficult for a user to grasp. We're all very familiar with this now, and we can kind of do it, but, you know, so, and each of those points is an intelligent decision-making point for autonomy to direct the project and impact the project. When you actually let them do that, and you, you let go, right? And I'm a complete control freak, right? So you can, you can ask anybody in their phone, this is what we do is just control everything that's in the room. But actually, just letting, your, letting go and just letting teams create success has worked really, really well. Which brings me to the absolutely horrifying conclusion that we can't actually kill the project managers. We actually have to turn everybody else into project managers like zombies because <laughs> the project managers, what they were responsible for now, that responsibility is shared across all, all of us. Okay, so we all have to be project managers. We all have to do the things that project managers, that project management book of knowledge, everybody needs to go back into and read that down because developers, designers, everybody needs to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>